Hey there, welcome into Fantasy Baseball today. Frank Scott and Chris all here on Wednesday, February 21st. Today on the show, starting pitcher preview part three. We've got through the top 36 in ADP so far. Today, we'll get through the rest, hopefully. And reveal our sleepers, breakouts, and busts at the position. Let's jump right back into starting pitcher ADP according to Fantasy Pros. Yesterday, we left off with Walker Bueller at SP36. And I'll be throwing these at you in groups of three, like we did on our outfield preview part two. And Chris, we'll start with you. First up, we have Hunter Green, Jordan Montgomery, and Merrill Kelly. They're all going between picks 130 and 136, mm -hmm. SPs 37 through 39. And Hunter Green, we know he does have tremendous strikeout upside. Also, bad control. He allows a lot of fly balls and hard contact in Great American Ballpark, which hasn't worked out so far. And he's a two-pitch pitcher though there has been talk that he's working on a curveball and a splitter. Jordan Montgomery remains a free agent, but has been consistent each of the past two years between a 320 and 348 ERA, between a 109 and 119 whip. Feels more like a floor raiser in fantasy than anything, which isn't a bad thing, but just kind of is who he is. Uh, and Merrill Kelly, very similar to Jordan Montgomery, very consistent over the past two years. The strikeout rate did jump last year, how much can we trust it? That I do not know. Chris, you get Hunter Green, Jordan Montgomery, Merrill Kelly. Yeah, I don't have a ton to say about Merrill Kelly and Jordan Montgomery. Jordan Montgomery, but partially because we don't know where he's going to play. And that matters. I mean, it's not the most important thing. Skill set matters more than where a pitcher's pitching, but it still matters. So it's hard to know exactly where to slot him when we don't know where he's going to pitch, which I think probably explains why the price is a little lower than it otherwise might be. I think those two guys are very globby, but fine. Hunter Green is by far the most interesting of this trio, and there's so much that's interesting about him, right? He's the hardest-throwing starting pitcher in baseball, basically, but his fastball is not very good. It gets a lot of whiffs. It gets hit really hard. He has a tendency to live it, leave it over the plate a bit too often. He's a two-pitch pitcher, which we typically – especially when it's a fastball slider, we typically view that as, well, he's probably going to have split issues with platoons. Well, that's not the problem for Hunter Green at all. His OPS against left-handed batters is 7 Against righties, it's like 8 or something. He's been much worse against righties throughout his major league career, which is only 240 or so innings. But yeah, the, the issues ultimately come down to keeping the ball in the yard. And, and if he can do that, I think everything else will follow because he does have decent control, not great command, but decent control. He doesn't issue too many walks. He gets a ton of strikeouts. And so if he can keep the ball in the yard a little more consistently, I, I think there's a lot of room for Hunter Green to really take off. And he's working on a splitter and a curveball this, pre or this spring training. And... I don't know about the splitter. I know it's become the trendy pitch, especially for right-handed pitchers to to add to their repertoire this uh, spring. I don't think the, because like splitters are swing and miss pitches. You're trying to get chases. You're trying to get whiffs. He gets plenty of those. His problem is keeping the ball down in the zone, keeping the ball in the yard. That's why I think the curveball is the thing I'm going to be watching in spring training. Because if he can th consistently throw a curveball that he can, you know, throw, for, sneak by for a strike or, Curveballs tend to be pretty good ground ball pitches. I think that could add a an interesting dimension to his game. If I was going to draft any of these three, I, I think Hunter Green is clearly the one that that I would be most excited to. Mostly just because Jordan Montgomery and Merrill Kelly are pretty unexciting. Splitters, by the way, in spring training, it's like the the Oprah gif. It's you get a splitter, you yeah. get a splitter. Everyone's trying to. Throw yeah, Mike Petriello of, of MLB.com has a great thread where he's been tracking how many people are adding splitters to their arsenal and it's it's like nine or ten players deep at this point okay i am trying to decide and i've been trying to decide this for months if merrill kelly's being horribly undervalued or not he was the 19th best pitcher in points leagues last year he's the 22nd best best pitcher in roto leagues last year he was not globby last year he avoided those disaster starts that caused pitchers like him, their ERAs to balloon. And, and he did have a career best strikeout rate, as you pointed out, Frank. Uh, he was actually just outside the top 20 in total strikeouts too. 
But I said he didn't. He avoided the disaster starts that pitchers like him had. And I'm 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 kind of of the belief that it was just happenstance that he just happened to avoid the disaster starts that somebody put. It wasn't anything special that he did to avoid it. Um, and especially, you know, a guy in his mid thirties having a career high strikeout rate, how likely is that to carry over? I guess what I'm saying here, here is while I initially ranked Merrill Kelly outside the glob, I've kind of come around to where everyone else is. And I'm, I'm thinking he's pretty globby, which is how Chris described him. But I do think, I do think he is, he's, he's distinct from the other globby pitchers in that he actually did not perform like a globby pitcher last mm -hmm. year. His changeup improved tremendously, Merrill Kelly. So if that kind of maintains and, and carries over into 2024, then there is a chance that we are undervaluing Merrill Kelly. But yeah, I think a lot of it does come down to uh, that Im improved changeup from last season. Next up, we have Shane Bieber, Mitch Keller, and Chris Sale, SP 40 through 42, going between picks 137 and 144. So I wrote up Shane Bieber as a bust back in January due to performance decline and a strained forearm from last year. Since then, we have a video on social media of Shane Bieber at Driveline Baseball consistently hitting 93 miles per hour with his fastball. Each of the past two years, he's basically been sitting 91 miles per hour. So if he's throwing 93 in spring, I think I'm probably going to have to take him off the bus list because uh, that would be very good news for Shane Bieber. Mitch Keller had a very successful season posting career highs in innings and strikeouts, but he is prone to big blow-up starts and had a very rough second half. Uh, and Chris Sale traded to the Atlanta Braves this offseason for Vaughn Grissom. Sale's entering his age 35 season, still has tremendous strikeout upside, but we know the injuries have been a problem. Has not thrown more than 102 and two-thirds innings since 2019. Scott, I feel like you have a ton to say about this entire group. It's yours. Yeah. I, I mean, do you want me to save sale for sleepers and, and Mitch Keller for breakouts? And I could go just address it. Shane go Bieber now. now. Go for it. Yeah, now. I have. Oh, go for it now. Okay. Uh, yeah. So on the subject of Shane Bieber, uh, the tweet that came out from his time at driveline. So in this session that was tweeted out, he threw 10 heaters more than 93 miles per hour, his entire total of fastballs over 93 miles per hour in 2023 was eight. So he exceeded it just in that session. It is an indoor training session. It's not the same as being on a big league mound, but you'd think being on a big league mound in a game would give you more adrenaline. And, and if, if anything, it would ramp up the velocity. I don't know. I, I found it highly encouraging. It wasn't all they did. They, they also worked on the shape of his curveball. And think that's gotten back to with with the data they use, the way they're value, they're, the way they're able to evaluate pitchers' deliveries and their arsenals and their grips and, and maximize it all. Obviously, Driveline has a very good track record with fixing pitchers, and this is a potential game changer for Shane Bieber. It is. It, it takes me from wanting nothing to do with him because I felt like he just lost his fastball and everything else was falling apart. Uh, last year, that seemed to be the case with him losing the effectiveness of his breaking balls and. He might be completely restored now. I think spring training will tell us a lot, but I'm I'm more on the side of calling Shane Bieber a sleeper now than uh, than wanting to avoid him like I was before this news. Can I just quickly play devil's advocate? Of course. Uh, driveline baseball is a business. Mm -hmm. They are in the business of selling baseball players the belief that they can help improve their game. And they appear to do a very good job with it. I think they're, I would love to see a complete list of everybody who goes to driveline baseball every off season and kind of, cause we remember the hits, you know, we remember Mookie Betts and we kind of, you know, use that to, to move everything forward. But like Logan Gilbert is, I think a really fun example of, and we talked about this a little bit on yesterday's podcast. He went to driveline baseball last year and the, the Mariners have a, a good pitching lab of their own. And they, they seem to be a really innovative and inventive organization when it comes to pitch development. He took a big step backwards last year, despite adding a splitter, the pitch that everybody's adding. And it was a really good pitch for him. I think it was the 14th best pitch in baseball savants run values. I was looking that up earlier. Like it worked. It was a really good pitch. And Logan Gilbert was still just kind of, the same decent pitcher that he was the year before. So yeah, I'm not, I, 
spoiler alert, when we get to sleepers, Shane Bieber will be a part of the discussion for me. I, I, I'm i with you guys. I just, mm -hmm. I think it's worth continuing to keep a skeptical eye because I think the the way we in the fantasy baseball world tend to talk about driveline baseball is it's magic and it's not and it's hard work. work and technology and they're 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 trying to solve issues that just in shane bieber's case may not be solvable right like it, it's possible sure. that the game and, and that he made in the lab won't show up on the game and and i'm much more interested in what driveline can do for a broken pitcher like logan gilbert i'm not sure there was much mm -hmm. they could do to improve him he's already so good but that's what i'm saying though is the splitter worked like the the theory was he's going to add this splitter it's going to be a great swing and miss pitch it's going to give him a great off and that was true and it still didn't make him a better pitcher it's it's something to keep in mind with hunter green and all these guys we're going to talk about in the off season is more velocity new pitches it doesn't always actually work out and we, we shouldn't treat it as a, oh God, right. I, I'm, I'm, there, I'm, not, a I, I'm not recommending anybody's how you pronounce the word as an ace. I'm, I'm yeah, just yeah, saying no. there's hope now. Yeah. Yeah. Last point I wanted to add on, on Shane Bieber was that driveline doesn't take away the injury risk either. That is mm -hmm. still real and that is still there. So uh, I, again, that could pop up at any time. You know, Scott, let's save Mitch Keller and Chris Sale for later because we, we spent a lot of time on Shane Bieber, but you will get an opportunity to talk about them. I promise you that. Uh, before we move on, let's promote a few things. Our FBT newsletter. Chris does a great job with it, and you can find it at cbsportscom slash newsletters. You can scan the QR code in the top right corner. Chris is sending out position previews, uh, the latest news, spring training, anything that you need to know that's going on. It's delivered right to your inbox. You can sign up for free. We have another mailbag coming up this Friday. Make sure to send your questions in fantasy baseball at cbsi.com. That's the letter I. If you have a top prospect you want to hear about on the prospect spotlight, leave us a five star rating on Apple and drop the prospect's name in the review. Let's continue on. The next trio of pitchers is Michael King, Bailey Ober, and Jose Barrios, SP 43 through 45, going between picks 149 and 161. I kind of just want to take all three of these and talk about them for the next 10 minutes because uh, I do like all three quite a bit. Uh, King was traded over to the Padres in the Juan Soto deal this offseason. Pretty awesome with the Yankees down the stretch last year. The pitch mix looks legit. Um, the problem, he hasn't handled a starter's workload since 2018 when he was back in the minors. All Bailey Ober has done is pitch well in his career. 57 starts, a 363 ERA, 111 whip, 13% swinging strike rate with great control. He only averages 91 miles per hour on the fastball, but he's six foot nine and he gets great extension on the mound, which helps that fastball play up. And Jose Barrios bounced back last year from his awful 2022 with a pretty normal Jose Barrios type season. He's an innings eater. He has the third most innings pitched since 2018 behind only Garrett Cole and Aaron Ola. I think he is a totally fine rotation stabilizer, SP4, SP5, especially if you take on some injury risks like a glass now or Rodon, whatever it might be. Uh, Chris, anything on King, Ober, and Barrios? I think Barrios at this point is very much in that Merrill Kelly, Jordan Montgomery range. Or... But he goes later. He can be, yeah, he can be useful. I don't think he's that interesting. I don't think it's really worth spending much time talking about him. Lobby. Bailey Ober, um, it's kind of joe ryan but without the bad 11 starts at the end of last season right like that's because the the thing with joe ryan was all he did was perform all throughout the minors every time he pitched in the majors until that last what was it 11 12 starts something that we were talking about yesterday and i i agree it makes sense to be skeptical about joe ryan and bailey ober's a lot cheaper but it does feel like Joe Ryan, it, it feels a little bit like Bailey Ober's pulling off a trick. And that trick might be more sustainable because he's so tall and he has such great extension that it, it might be. But like the the stuff models think his stuff is really bad. Yep. And that may just not matter because of all the other confounding variables. But I I think it's okay to be skeptical about Bailey Ober as well. And then Michael King, I mean... <laughs> The stuff is great there. there. There's not really any questioning the stuff. He's been very good whenever he's pitched at the major league level. I think it's a 338 career ERA, bunch of strikeouts, great reliever, really, really good starter for 
eight to 10 starts last year at the end of the season. It's just a question of whether he can do it one for two months as a starting pitcher. Cause he's never done that at the major league level. And then a full season. It's kind of, if he does it for two months, I still won't necessarily be fully bought in on Michael King because I think there's injury risk, there's performance risk, but um, I wrote a late round sleepers for each category article on CBS sports.com. And Michael King's not really going in the late rounds. I think his ADP is around one fiftieth, but he's one of the better. Like if you're looking for ERA help, I think Michael King in the middle rounds has a really high ceiling or yeah, which means a low ERA potential. So I like him. I think he's super risky at his price, but it's probably okay to draft him there. I, I kind of see Bailey Obermore in that George Kirby, Logan Gilbert light, where he should have a great whip. He's excellent control. His fly ball tendencies help him to prevent hits. Base runners, he, he's good at keeping them to a minimum. I don't know that he's going to get the volume of those guys with his size. You feel like Bailey Ober could take on a lot more volume, but that's, I don't know. I, I, I haven't been that bullish on him because he doesn't get a lot of strikeouts. And that's my whole thing. And when you're drafting pitchers in the glob, but I, I see the appeal of Bailey Ober. Um, and I wanted to say also for Michael King, I see the appeal for him too. I mean, he it was a, tremendous eight start stretch it looked like the stuff carried over from relief but his injury history is just a major red flag for me specifically the elbow fracture he suffered two years ago i mean that is a usage injury that is your body is not withstanding the torque you put on it mm -hmm. and, and you're trying to extend that guy over a starter's workload i am very scared just like i was saying for jacob de grom last year like i just i i feel like it's you know, he hadn't he hadn't had the repeated injuries that DeGrom had, but the nature of the injuries makes me think this is not really going to work out for King for, you know, full season workload. Plus, for all the strikeouts he got in a starting role, very low swinging strike rate. So I'm I'm a little, little bit questioning the strikeouts for King, too. I completely agree on the injury history, Scott. I guess why I like Michael King as a, a breakout candidate, obviously, if he stays healthy, I think he could perform better than this on a per inning basis. Um, the only thing is, you know, where he's going, there's not as much risk, right? As like, whatever, Tyler Glass, now you have to take in the third or fourth round. You know, with Michael King, you're getting him outside of the top 10 rounds in fantasy right now. Right, so obviously right. uh, a big difference it, in price. It, there. The difference between those examples, and, and for most injury-prone pitchers, is I feel like there's hope of them avoiding the injuries. In a King's case, it, it just seems inevitable to mm -hmm. me because of the kind of injury it was. I could be wrong, but that is that is the distinction I make there. And Go ahead, I'll also point out big park upgrade for Michael King. Yep. Yeah. Yankee Stadium, very tough place to pitch. Petco Park, very, very good place to pitch. So that's also worth noting. Last point I wanted to make on Bailey Ober, I guess two points. There is a downside in that the twins haven't really let him go that deep into games consistently. He only mm -hmm. uh he only completed six innings once over his final 10 starts. I I think they were trying to limit his innings down the stretch, so that's why. Uh for anyone who I, this would be completely reasonable. Who thinks it's hypocritical that I don't like Joe Ryan, but I do like Bailey Ober? They are very similar pitchers. Bailey Ober goes 65 picks later on yeah. average. So that's a huge difference. And mm -hmm. I, I trust his secondary pitches more. I, I think they are but, better and more established. I, than yeah, Bailey, I, I, I Bailey Ober with yeah. a 30% strikeout rate might be worth 60 picks. I, I don't think they're that similar, to be honest, unless you're just saying their fastball isn't particularly high velocity. I, I don't. And that they're both I, fly ball heavy and they're probably well, going to allow home runs. Joe Ryan, just for him to succeed, his fastball has to be next to unhittable, even though it's low velocity. Like he people, players need to swing through it. And I don't, I'm not confident they're going to keep swinging through it. Bailey Ober is more pitch to contact and, and it's, it's different. It's different results. Those two are looking for. I, I know the strikeout rate is vastly different, but the swinging strike rate, I feel like is not far off. Maybe I'm making that up, but like Bailey over 13% swinging strike rate. I mean, that's, that's well above league average. So look, he's not, he doesn't he have the strikeout strike upside. Strike we can move on. But uh, yeah, I think the way they go about it, in my opinion, is not dissimilar. Let's take our first break. When we return uh, the next group, we have Carlos Rodon, Christian Javier and Hunter Brown right after this. My kingdom. Challenger 
Welcome back in. Let's continue on with starting pitcher ADP. And next up, we have Carlos Rodon, Christian Javier, and Hunter Brown. Starting pitchers 46 through 48, going between picks 165 and 170. Rodon had a disastrous first season with the Yankees. My guess is that he was never healthy. Uh, we did see his upside in 2021 and 2022 when Rodon performed like a top 10 starting pitcher. If you look at war, he was the third most valuable pitcher in baseball over that two-year stretch, and he did it with a lot less innings than the top two pitchers at the time. I, I think it was like Corbin Burns and maybe Garrett Cole. Um, but that just goes to show you how dominant he was. Uh, so far, reports are great for Carlos Rodon. He's you know, pumping like 97 miles per hour. Uh, in camp, so we'll see if he can keep that up. Christian Javier followed up his breakout 2022 with a dud. He's a two-pitch pitcher, and both pitches regressed. Uh, fastball velocity dropped from 93.8 miles per hour to 92.7 miles per hour. Showed some signs of kind of bouncing back later in the season, but it's very much so up in the air right now with Christian Javier. Uh, and a tale of two seasons for Hunter Brown. He was great for the first three months, and then over the final three months, he had an ERA over six. He throws hard. He has a great curveball. Feels like he needs something else. Talk out of Astros camp is that Hunter Brown has been working on a traditional slider. Maybe that's the third pitch that he needs here in the arsenal. Uh, Chris, you are up. Rodon, Javier, and Hunter Brown. I, I don't see much case for Michael King to be drafted ahead of Carlos Rodon. This feels like the, the height of recency bias. I know... Carlos Rodon was really, really bad last season, and Michael King was really, really good for 11 starts at the end of last season. Like you said, in 2021 and 2022, Carlos Rodon was one of the five best pitchers in baseball on a per inning basis. We've never seen, even in that really good stretch for Michael King, we haven't seen that kind of upside with the strike, with the strikeouts, with the whiff rates, with all of it. So if I'm going to bet on one of those guys with gigantic injury and workload question marks, I'm going to do it with Carlos Rodon. He's a top 35 pitcher for me. Michael King is not. So that is one where I would definitely rather have Carlos Rodon, especially with the promising reports out of camp. The interesting thing about Carlos Rodon is at least when you just looked at his pitches and what they did when he left, when they left his hand, he looked very similar to the previous year last year. His velocity was down 0.2 miles per hour on his fastball, identical on his slider, spin rates almost identical, movement profiles very, very similar, and yet he was just dreadful. It was a, a total disaster for him. I don't know what to make of that, but given that he's currently healthy, given that he has, by all accounts, looked very good in, in spring training, I am much more inclined to buy into a Carlos Rodon bounce back than I am to mm -hmm. fade him. Even with obviously right up there with Tyler glass now and, and anybody else in terms of injury risk, but obviously much, much yeah. cheaper. I'm not sure the upside for Carlos Rodon is any lower than it is for Tyler glass. Now. I'm, I mean, this late to get a pitcher with obvious ace upside, I think, is and, I mean, particularly since we're into the glob at this point. Carlos Rodon represents your one of your best hopes of getting a pitcher who's better than the glob, who transcends the glob. And I think there's a pretty, you know, pretty logical explanation. I mean, he came into spring. He had forearm issues. Even when he came back from the forearm issues, he had back issues and his delivery was just messed up. I mean, the Yankees pitching coach. Matt Blake has is, is basically already said as much, encouraging signs early this spring. It's, of course, not it, it's 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 not a slam dunk. Carlos Rodon is back, but I think for the price and the upside, it's well worth it's a it's a chance. Well, it's it's a shot. Well, a gamble well worth taking at this point. OK, any thoughts on the Astros guys here? Javier Hunter Brown. Oh, gosh, I like Javier. Hunter Brown. <laughs> you like Hunter Brown. I like Hunter Brown. He's got a good fastball. He's got two good breaking balls. I think command is probably not going to be a strong suit for him, but we saw the upside for him in the first half last year, and you know uh, he couldn't sustain it, obviously, but there were stretches where Hunter Brown looked like a very, very good pitcher, and I, I acknowledge it all fell apart for him rather quickly, but yeah. I, I think the, the pieces are there for Hunter Brown as he continues to develop. And 
it's a it's a cheap bet on the Astros figuring something out with the talented pitch. I I guess I just feel like why why is Hunter Brown because there's a lot of talented pitchers who were bad last year. Why is Hunter Brown going so far ahead of the other talented pitchers who basically didn't deliver results up to what we think their skill level is? Why why is he being elevated in this way? And I don't really have a good answer for that. So. I think this is too expensive. Yeah, he, he's SP44 for me. So I'm lower than, than this. Um, or I guess that's right around where he's going, isn't it? Now, Javier, I mean, obviously at this time last year, Javier was a very popular pick. Uh, he had already had his best season, and people were projecting even more for him, a breakout on top of the breakout. And uh, he ended up having his worst season instead of his best season, worst season by a long shot. Uh, I think a lot of people, it, it, my impression is a lot of people are just out on him. And... The same argument I made for Joe Ryan, you could apply to Christian Javier too. He's mainly just a fastball with modern characteristics that that allows him to uh, excel. Has like the ideal modern characteristics that allow him to excel in a way beyond what the scouting reports suggest when he was coming up through the minors. And maybe the league's catching up to that. Except in Javier's case, it's more like the characteristics of the fastball changed than the league caught mm -hmm. up to those characteristics. He just did not get the same um, vertical movement on that pitch that he got in previous years. There, It seemed like it started to improve toward the end of the year and into the playoffs. That's reason for hope. But more than anything, because it's something that changed for him rather than the league catching up to him or him... Uh, you know, losing ability, lo losing, a f I don't want to say losing effectiveness, but like he, rather than him physically breaking down or the league catching up to him, he did something wrong. He was doing something wrong last year. And so that creates a situation where he could fix it. Right. And, and so, I mean, I'll need to see some evidence of that this spring, probably for me to get really excited about Christian Javier, but I'm more open to drafting him in this range than most people seem to be. All right, we drop down into the next group where we find Hugh Darvish, Bryce Miller, and Eduardo Rodriguez. Starting pitchers 49 through 51, picks 174 through 179. Darvish is, is entering his age 37 season. Does he have one more bounce back left in him? Uh, he was shut down in August last season with a bone spur in his elbow, which is obviously worrisome, but apparently has no limitations this spring. Bryce Miller is a polarizing player. He got called up by the Mariners. And he wowed us his first five starts. People were spending crazy fab left and right to get him. And then over his final 20 outings, a 531 ERA. So obviously took some uh, steps back there. He does rank highly in stuff plus, but we haven't really seen that play out in games just yet. And Eduardo Rodriguez signed a four-year, $80 million contract with the D-backs this offseason. He had his best season just uh, yet, but the control regressed in the second half, something I am a little bit worried about Scott. What do you think on Darvish, Bryce Miller, and Erod? I think Darvish is in the same category as like Jose Barrios and uh, some of these other globby pitchers that we talked about, where he should give you good, uh, good volume, and the final ERA and WHIP should be respectable enough that he's worth having on a roster. But he's he's going to remain globby, I think, and. Um, it's not really worth digging into too much. You Darvish, I think he's forever globby now too. I mean, two years in a row where his strikeout numbers are way down. One of them, he was still pretty effective. One, not so much. He's in his late thirties. I, I think he's clearly post prime and I'm not expecting a bounce back for him. Bryce Miller is probably the most interesting here. And I will go ahead and say that for where, for where he's going here within the glob toward the front end of the glob, I'm pretty much out on Bryce Miller. I, I have him as one of my best picks for this year. I'm not exactly sure what others are seeing. He doesn't have enough of a secondary. He has a good fastball. He doesn't have enough to go with the fastball. There's talk of he's de him developing a splitter this spring like everybody else. But I I for most of those guys, if they, if they don't already have a, a pretty good talent base to work with, um, I'm going to need to see it to believe it and i would put bryce miller in that category 
his numbers after his first so he he came up and and mostly on the the back of that fastball dominated for his first nine starts um it went six plus innings consistently had a 360 ADRA, maybe dominating is overstating it a bit. he dominated the first month for, yeah the first the first five starts he had a 115 ERA. so let's use that as the cutoff it was first, like the best five start run of a pitcher to start his career there were like all kinds of historic numbers that he had last year first five starts a 115 era and then the final 20 he had a 531 era so just that him him like catching the league by surprise over those first five starts dropped bryce miller's full season era by a full run because it 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 could have been Mm -hmm. mid three mid fives and instead it was mid fours um and, and yeah, I, I just don't think he showed enough to give me optimism heading into this season. I, I'm a I'm a big Bryce Miller skeptic, but I, I can see the case for it. You know, when when you start your arsenal off with a fastball that's really, really good, that's that's a really good starting point. And he's got that, you know, Christian Javier esque ideal in uh, like induced vertical break. Is that what IVB means? I, that, that's one of those things that I'm not quite sure what it actually means. I'm not smart enough to understand it, but he's got a good fastball. He gets whiffs with it. The the results were pretty good. The slider by the stuff metrics is a pretty good pitch, even though he didn't get a lot of whiffs with it. The sweeper rates out really, really well. The problem with both the sweeper and the slider, and this is something Bryce Miller has been working on this offseason, is he dropped his arm angle like four inches when he threw those two pitches. And so batters just didn't swing at it. His sweeper had a 17% whiff rate, which is just disaster. That that wouldn't be a good swinging strike rate for a sinker, let alone a breaking ball. So the the talk is this offseason he spent retooling his arsenal to, to better mimic the release point with his breaking balls. He's adding that splitter. That's the case for it you have to do a lot of projecting to get him to this point. And this is a relatively cheap price to begin with, but I can see the case for it. Now I'll just say, I'm actually very interested in you Darvish. Uh, I think the, the stuff was mostly still there. I think the, the fact that he got bone spurs removed from his elbow, I, I think that's actually a positive sign because that's not a, a structural issue. That's just a, Oh, maybe that's why he wasn't good last year, but it doesn't, I don't I don't think bone spurs should be the kind of issue that once you get them removed, you worry about moving forward. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm kind of in on a another like the seventh you Darvish bounce back. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked, like, can he do it again? Right. It's just if you look at you Darvish's career, it's like buy you Darvish when his price is low. He's kind of like Blake Snell, right? Like buy him when he's down yeah. and then sell him when he's high, basically. Did he actually get them removed though, Chris? Because I couldn't find anything that like he okay. had injury. Uh, maybe not then. I, that's what I, that was what I was assuming, but maybe not. I mean, I would assume you like, you have to get them removed eventually. Right. But I couldn't find anything. He had a similar injury years ago. He got yeah. bone spurs removed and he bounced back the following year. So I was like you thought, okay, if he gets this fixed, I think he could bounce back, but I can't find anything that. actually. Yeah, no, I him. guess he, uh, yeah, there, there's nothing. Yeah, you're, you're right. That that's, that's my bad. I, I, I just kind of assumed that that was what, uh, what happened, but I'm not seeing anything there. Yeah. So that's a fair point. Yeah. He's a name to watch though in, in spring. Like if, if Darvish comes out here looking like Darvish, just for him going as late as he is and based on his track record, I, I still think there might be something left, but he, mm-hmm. he's a name to watch here early on. 37 is how old he is. I said late 30s. I just yeah. wanted to stress that again. You're 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 asking for a bounce back season from a 37 year old. Stranger things have happened, but doesn't happen often. I mean, he did it as a 35 year old. Why can't he do it as a 37 year old? Scott, we just got it from Justin Verlander a couple of years ago. So it's true, <laughs> and I was very much in on that, but. That's Justin. That's Justin Verlander. Come on. All right. Uh, next trio is Nick Pavetta, Braxton Garrett, and Nathan Avaldi. SP fifty-two through fifty-four picks one eighty-two through one eighty-six. And uh, Nick Pavetta made some uh, real changes to his pitch mix last year, and obviously was great in the second half. Uh, Braxton Garrett has quietly pitched well over the past two years. He's made. He's pitched in forty-eight games, forty-seven starts. 
a 363 ERA, a 118 whip. The problem is that he does have some shortness, uh, soreness in his left shoulder that he's currently dealing with. And Nathan Avaldi, I mean, we kind of we go through this every year. When he's mm-hmm. healthy, he pitches well. Once you start to see the velocity, the velocity drops every year. It drops as the first start that it drops, just sell them off. Try yep. and sell high for anything that you could get uh, on Nathan Avaldi. But that's kind of been the trend the past couple of years. Scott, what do we have on Avaldi, Braxton Garrett, and Nick Pavetta? Well, I love Nick Pavetta. He's one. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna call him a breakout for the purposes of this podcast. I've, I've listed him as a sleeper elsewhere, but you know, I have good feelings about him basically. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead and get into explaining why I do. And the reason why I do for Nick Pavetta is because, okay, let's begin with the second half numbers, a 330 ERA, a 0.96 whip, 12.5 K per nine. Now, a lot of that was coming out of the bullpen but it was extended appear- appearances out of the bullpen. A lot of times he was the bulk guy following an opener, or even when he wasn't, he pitched two or three innings. It was it was a lot of multi-inning uh, appearances for, for Pavetta as he put up that 330 ERA, 0.96 whip, and 12.5 K per nine. And of course, we've thought he had upside in the past. The 2019 season, um, he was one of the trendiest breakout picks that year. What's held him back is poor command and that's what got him sent to the bullpen for the red sox in mid-may he was throwing 63 percent of his pitches for strikes before then once he got moved to the bullpen he started throwing 66 percent of his pitches for strikes much much better and um apparently he worked with chris martin on mindset uh the reliever chris martin one of the best strike throwing oh not the cold play lead singer not the cold play okay. ring. Sorry, I... winger. He so Chris Martin kind of took him under his wing, and based on the um, the the improvement in strike throwing for Nick Pavetta, I think it rubbed off. He eventually did get moved back to a true starting role for the Red Sox late in the year, and actually his final two appearances, he went seven innings in both, allowed a combined five hits in those fourteen innings, just two walks, struck out seventeen. So I am hopeful that Nick Pavetta's figured things out. The Reds seem optimistic and obviously made sure not to block him in the starting rotation this offseason. So he is one of my, uh, particularly as someone who really is emphasizing strikeouts this year, he is, he is somebody I'm drafting on basically every team. So that's Nick Pavetta. Can I ask, uh, <clears throat> can I ask a Nick Pavetta related question? Sure. What is the tangible difference between Nick Pavetta at SP? What what are we at? 50 ish? Mm-hmm. 52. And you say Kikuchi at SP 72. You say Kikuchi had a 21 start stretch from June 4th on, where he had a 356 ERA, a 320 FIP, 129 strikeouts, and 111 and a third innings. Really good stuff, has always had really good stuff. He's another guy we've been waiting to put it all together. Yusei Kikuchi has tinkered with the best of them. This guy changes his pitch mix dang near every year, but last year he seemed to find something that worked for him. I just, I think those two guys are incredibly similar, and I I can't really uh, understand the the gigantic difference in price. if, If Nick Pavetta's changes are legit, then he's going to be closer to 11 K per nine. Well, you, you say Kikuchi is going to be like 9.5 per nine. Also hit ability, uh, batting average against for Pavetta, much, much lower. I mean, Kikuchi gave him a lot of hits and always has. Uh, so I, I think, I think there's an order of magnitude difference in terms of upside between Nick Pavetta and, and you say Kikuchi. Kikuchi seems like firmly a glob guy when Pavetta has the upside to transcend the glob. Unless you just don't buy the improvements for Pavetta, in which case well, it's I, I pretty globby to you. Yeah, I it's Nick Pavetta. You know, like it's I a, it's a I Nick tried Pavetta to do the, unlike we've ever seen before. Well, sure, but it's a new Yusei Kikuchi like we've never seen before. Yeah, and it was, and he wasn't like his it, his level of success was more sustained than Nick Pavetta's last year. Sure. Like it I wasn't just, as brilliant. He didn't he know. didn't burn as brightly. He it just 
it's a 31 year old with a career 486 ERA who has always underperformed his peripherals. He underperformed his peripherals last year. It just, I just think that's who he is. And I think as long as you're not expecting a good ERA, I think Nick Pavetta is a fine pitcher. But, but he made uh, tangible changes. So, right. But again, so did you say Kikuchi? That's true. I, and gigantic I, I, increase and, in curveball usage, it, change the shape of his slider. Like, I, but it I, didn't lead to the results weren't as good. 3.290 ERA over a four month span. That's really good. 10.4K per nine over that four month span. That's really good. That's an extended. I'm not. That is a good. Use, I'm not, not really as good as a, what Pavetta was doing. I'm not really a Yusei Kikuchi guy anymore. Mm. I've, I've, I've grown, but I think I, I just, if I'm going to make, this is one of those ones where if I'm going to make that bet, I think I'd rather just make it on the cheaper guy. Yeah. Kikuchi's ADP, by the way, 268.2 as yeah. the 73rd starting pitcher off the board. So he is going uh much later in drafts. I, I did just want to point out again, real quick, uh, like Braxton Garrett is someone that I was interested in. And like, if it's the shoulder is such a bummer, if it turns out the shoulder is mm -hmm. fine. I mean, you could get him with potentially the last pick of your draft. But, he, you know, he's changed his pitch mix the past couple of years. The control has improved. He obviously pitches in a great ballpark. I, If he's healthy, I do have some slight interest in Braxton mm -hmm. Garrett. My, my, my objection to Garrett, even if he is healthy, is not enough strikeouts, of course, and not enough innings on top of it. Like, he's he's he doesn't consistently go even six and never exceed six, which maybe that'll change one of these years. But that's been the... No, he, knock on him so far. He, he's it's a hard to be an effective fantasy pitcher like that. He's a floor raiser for sure. It's not a high ceiling profile, but like, you know, you draft him as the 60th pitcher and he pit finishes as the 45th pitcher or something like that. That I think that's a, a reasonable expectation for Braxton Garrett. All right, let's take our final break. When we return, we've got Gavin Williams right after this. Out there, there are two colossal beings, both forces of nature in their own regard. But in here, as soon as the chute bursts open, the duality of man and beast begins to fade. This is the PBR on CBS Sports Network. Back into starting pitcher ADP we go, and this next group includes Gavin Williams, Shane Boz, and Lucas Giolito, SP 55 through 57, picks 193 through 196. Gavin Williams... Kind of the forgotten top pitching prospect from last year. He pitched well. He has a great fastball and two breaking pitches that get whiffs. The next step for him will be to improve the control. Just over four walks per nine last year. It was an issue for him in the minors as well. So we don't really have evidence that it's going to improve. But if it does, then there could be big upside for Gavin Williams. Shane Boz has all the talent in the world. But upon ar arriving to camp, we learned that he will be built up slowly by the Rays and will start an extended spring training before a rehab assignment uh, and has never thrown more than, I believe it's just over 90 innings in a full professional season. Lucas Giolito signed a two-year, $38.5 million deal with the Red Sox, and to be honest, it kind of feels like an awful fit because he has struggled mightily the past couple of years. Uh -huh. Walks, home runs being a problem. Now he goes to the AL East. He's going to be pitching in Fenway Park. I know the Red Sox have done some interesting things and there's people who are smarter than me that like the the pitching coaches and, and the advisors that they brought in. So maybe they'll do something to kind of fix Gilito, but there is a lot that needs to be fixed. Chris, you are up. Gavin Williams, Shane Boz, Lucas Gilito. Uh, this is another one where I look at Gavin Williams and I look at Hunter Brown and Hunter Brown is someone I like, but I can't necessarily see much difference between the two of them. It's very similar profiles. Good fastball seemingly good secondaries i would rather have gavin williams straight yeah up. I, I, I would too. i would too I, I think i would as well and, and i say that as someone who generally likes hunter brown so i, I don't really uh see that i i have gavin williams as a top 40 starting pitcher for the the upcoming season boz you can't draft here uh it just he he's gonna start in in spring in extended spring training he's not gonna pitch in in the actual spring as far as we understand so like this sounds like a June debut at the earliest, but he's, I guess he will be on the IL. He's probably going to open on the, the, he's already on the 15 day IL, I would guess. So I guess that's a, a case for him because you'd be able to stash him, but it just, he's unproven. It, it just, it feels like this is a, a, an iffy price for him. It's more like 
you know, 70, 75th at starting pitchers where I dropped him after that news. So he won't go here and he shouldn't. Giolito, I just, I don't know. I, I can't say it's impossible that he turns it around, but uh, I'm very skeptical. But my is own, a good fit. My only interest in Giolito is that even though he was bad last year and especially bad down the stretch once he left the White Sox and it was here, it was around seven in with his, with the Angels and Guardians. He had more than 200 strikeouts last year, and it's it's awfully late to be able to get a guy who does that. So, um, you know, if you're if you're looking to play catch up at strikeouts at that point and you just want to cross your fingers on the ERA and whip. I, I, yeah. Giolito at least serves that purpose. I'm totally with you on Gavin Williams. I, I think like in terms of the caliber of pitching prospect, they all were Gavin Williams was up there with Grayson Rodriguez and, um, and Bobby Miller. And I think part of the reason he's so much lower here is he didn't stick around long enough to have that, to turn the corner like they did and find that next level that has everybody so optimistic, but it's still, like if you're just going to trust in the pedigree, it's definitely there for Williams. Mm -hmm. And at this point in the draft, there's there's not a lot of downside to taking him. I also wanted to say real quick for uh, for um, oh I guess you already said it for Shane Boss. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, he's not a sure enough thing when he's healthy to wait out his return. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like Max Scherzer stashing him for when he. It probably won't be that long of a wait for Boz that it is for Scherzer, but you, you know what I mean? Might be, yeah. P particularly if you don't have IL spots and you're just going to have to keep this guy on your bench all that time. It's it's kind of hard for me to justify drafting Shane Boz at all, knowing yep. he's delayed for the start of the year. Yeah, it's going to be like in, a, in one of those NFBC leagues where you 15 teams don't have an IL spot. I kind of think he's just not a viable draft pick. And you know, Chris, you brought up something interesting because... If they're talking about sending Shane Boz out to extended spring training, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're going to put him on the IL. He still has options. So mm -hmm. if you play in a league where he doesn't go on the IL, I mean, he's just taking up one of your bench spots. And if that's yeah. the case too, I mean, that that completely changes. Yeah, that's an interesting. Yeah, I don't know whether it would be more worth it. I mean, it would save them like one hundred and seventy thousand dollars or whatever. So that might be just enough to to send him down for the raise. Uh, Tampa. Well, they could put him on a sixty if they wanted to open a forty man spot. They could put him on the sixty day IL. But then you're talking about him missing sixty days, so that's not yeah. And you're <laughs> you're paying him his major league salary, so that that's true, yeah. True. We'll see. That's, yeah. that's a thing. It's it's the raise. <laughs> Something to watch with Tampa Bay. Let's get into our favorite sleepers, breakouts, and busts at the position. We'll go through about two to three of these um, each per person here. And again, let's keep it moving. Still have lots of ADP. Scott, you are up. Some sleepers at starting pitcher. All right. Now I'm going to take my opportunity to talk about Chris Sale, who is a sleeper of mine for like the third straight year. And just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. This case, they is the Braves and Alex Anthopoulos and the fact that he used up his best trade chip in Vaughn Grissom to get Chris Sale. And basically for the same justification I've had all this time, when he's been healthy, he has still been one of the most dominant bat missers in the game. His 11K per nine last year would have ranked fifth among qualifiers. His 13.2% swinging strike rate would have ranked ninth. Um, the ERA finished high, but... You know, over a small sample, you, you can forgive that when a guy's missing at bat, missing bats to the extent Chris Sale was. And also part of Anthopolis' justification, which has been part of my own, is that most of the injuries he's dealt with over the years have been pretty freaky things. Like, One was like a bike accident, right? Bike accident, getting a line drive off the wrist. There was the Tommy John surgery, but that's pretty... You know, it's like four years removed by now. Yeah. Most pitchers are going to go through that at some point. Chris Sale put it off a lot longer than most. And uh, he, he did go on the IL with a shoulder last year, though, Scott. So yes. That's kind of scary. Right. I was building up to that. The one exception is actually the injury he suffered last year, which is kind of like I was talking about with Michael King stress fracture in the shoulder. It was elbow in King's case, mm -hmm. which is a usage related injury. And does that preclude him from taking on a big workload still? As late as he's going, as many strikeouts as he's likely to give you in even only two-thirds of a season, I think it's worth taking the, the shot on him. And maybe you'll get lucky and, and Chris Sale happens to stay healthy for 30 starts. 
If that's the case, he's giving you 220 strikeouts. He might be winning you 15 plus games with the Braves offense backing him. Mm -hmm. There's legit ace upside here still. And every year I say that and he falls short of it again, the price becomes all the more affordable. So the Braves enthusiasm is enough for me to renew my own enthusiasm. And I'm calling Chris Sale a sleeper again. Bam. All right. You want to tell us about Eric Fetty? All right, yeah, let's talk about Fetty because I like Fetty a lot. He's one of the players I love. You might remember from our Valentine's Day episode. I'll sum it up pretty quickly here. He uh, went to Korea last year. He was the best player in the league. He went 20-6, and six, an even two ERA, .95 whip, 209 strikeouts and 180 and a third innings in a league where there's not a ton of strikeouts. He had a ton mm -hmm. of strikeouts. Um, and so he won the MVP. He won their equivalent of the Cy Young. He was he was amazing. And it's not just that he dominated in Korea. It's that he completely changed his arsenal the offseason before going to Korea. And those were the results. Added a sweeper to get those swings and misses. Added a split change that's been compared to Logan Webb's. Incidentally, Webb led the majors with a 62.1% ground ball rate last year. Fetty's in Korea was 70%. So he even he out, out webbed Webb. Obviously, it's a different league and the numbers aren't going to translate perfectly. But he was really, really, really good in the same league where Merrill Kelly turned himself into a major league asset. And Kelly wasn't nearly as good there as Fetty was last year. So, yeah, I, I think for the next to nothing price, Fetty's, Fetty is maybe the single player that I'm, I'm going to draft most often this year because I try and get him in every league. And you can most likely get him with the very last pick of your draft, the ADP 385.2 as the 110th starting pitcher off the board. Chris, hit me with a couple sleepers here. All right. We already talked about Shane Bieber, but I'm adding him to my sleepers discussion as we speak. Uh, Nestor Cortez, as long as he's healthy, I think he's going to be really good. It's kind of a similar approach as Joe Ryan and, and all those guys we comp to where the, the fastball plays up despite mediocre velocity. He was consistently better than a strikeout per inning, consistently very, very good ERA and whip before last season kind of went south. And he struck out Juan Soto three straight times today to start off uh, live batting practice. So that's a pretty good sign that Nestor Cortez is feeling all right. Now, he downplayed it and said it's probably the first time Juan Soto has faced live pitching in, you know, four months or whatever it is. So he, he was being humble. But I, I do think that Nestor Cortez a true sleeper this season going outside of the top 250 in ADP right now. Um, I, I absolutely want him on my late round list. And then Chris Paddock, he, he came back from Tommy John surgery, only pitched, I think, five innings at the end of last season, but the velocity was up about two miles per hour. The fastball shape was back to where it was when he was a rookie, and that was a big pitch for him. Maybe the time off helped him further develop the breaking ball, but even if it didn't, if that fastball is pumping in like it was when he was a rookie, the changeup is an elite pitch. That was enough to make Chris Paddock a pretty good pitcher, and he's going very, very late. He's gonna. He said his goal is to throw 140 to 160 innings. He also said the Twins want him available for the postseason, so balancing those things is going to be tricky. There are going to be some inning limitations as well for him, but Chris Paddock is more than cheap enough 357 ADP for him. Thank you for adding that to the uh, list, Frank. Um, and then I'll just... Edward Cabrera. This is more of a, a wish list thing. I am going to draft Edward Cabrera with one of my last picks again this season. If that guy learns how to throw a fastball even remotely close to where he's supposed to, He's going to be a stud because everything else about him is so good. His changeup is a lethal pitch. And uh, I like to bet on talent and I like to bet on him figuring out. And I don't know, maybe getting to sit next to Sandy Alcantara will will help him uh, figure things out this this season. What if he has to sit next to Mitch Keller? Yeah, there are concerns that he'll be pit moved to, to Pittsburgh and we'll just throw sinkers 70% of the time. That's a that's an old joke. That's not fair. Um, but yeah, actually, Pittsburgh's not a bad place to pitch. They they might not be a worse team than the Marlins, so I'm not sure I'd downgrade him, but I would I would be sad to see him go. 
I do like the call on Nestor Cortez. Um, you mentioned the injuries from last year. He was dealing with a, a strained rotator cuff in his left shoulder. So obviously that's really worrisome. But one year removed from a 244 ERA and a point mm-hmm. ninety two whip. And uh, the projection uh, systems love him too. ATC has Nestor Cortez at SP37. So uh, I, I do think there's something there at his ADP as well. Three sleepers for me. First up, I've got Shota Imanaga, who is SP60. And uh, the ADP is 212.6. Came over from Japan this offseason, signed with the Cubs. He generates whiffs with great control from the left-hand side. He, too, has this vertical a vertical approach fastball. Doesn't throw particularly hard. It's like 91-92 with the fastball. Has a sweeper and a splitter. Interesting, because we don't see that many lefties with splitters. And We, we don't is- see lefties with splitters. I've been, <laughs> I've been racking my brain trying to find... Jorge De La Rosa is the last left-handed starting pitcher to qualify for the ERA title who threw a splitter more than 1% of the time. Yeah, so I I think it's going to be a pretty unique uh, pitch mix here and and just overall approach from Shota Imanaga. And according to Eno Saris, uh, the uh, Imanaga had the highest stuff plus in the WBC last year, even higher than Yamamoto. Obviously, it was a really small sample size. I love the value where he's going right now. Mm-hmm. It's going to have a lot. Uh, Aaron Savali, this is kind of my version of Chris Sale for Scott. It's just every year I write up Aaron Savali, right? It's It's got to happen eventually. Uh, SP63, 236.4 is the ADP. Just gives me such similar vibes to Zach Eflin this time last year. And Tampa Bay went out and traded a pretty meaningful prospect in Kyle Manzardo to get Aaron Savali on their team. Uh, Savali doesn't throw hard. He has a great curveball. He has strong command on the surface. His 10 starts with Tampa Bay uh, were bad, but he had a 29% strikeout rate. That was compared to 19% when he was in Cleveland. Some of the underlying numbers also buying what Savali did there as well. And then Christopher Sanchez, the ADP here, 313.2, SP83, you know, mid-career breakout with the Phillies last year. And based on the ADP, it seems like most people don't trust it, but he improved the control dramatically, uh, dropped his walks down to 1.5 per nine, generates a lot of ground balls, 57%, and made a very clear pitch mix change, uh, throwing more changeups. It is a nasty changeup. 148 batting average against 21.6% swinging strike rate. Uh, Christopher Sanchez going very late in drafts. Make sure to get him on your teams. Co- co-signed to Sanchez. He's one of my sleepers this year, too. He would have had a top five ground ball rate and walk rate if he had enough innings to qualify last year and then came all those strikeouts late in the year. So that's very interesting. The walk rate is so weird because he never had good control. That that's the one. He never had good numbers of any kind in the minors. He was like a 26 year old non prospect when he came up and and then he, he, yeah, it's, it could all disappear. He could be the, like the pitcher version of, uh, 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 Joey Manessis, (laughs) but, he could not be. I mean, pitchers are harder to predict in general. Also, Frank, did you get the best stat of all on Shota Imanaga? Uh, I'm not sure. Shota oh, Imanaga. So <laughs> the concern for pitchers coming over from, from Japan is, is you know, uh, different tackiness on the baseball. It's, 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 it's a different feel for the ball. Mm-hmm. Imanaga, like Yamamoto, pitched in the World Baseball Classic last year. So we have results of him using the Major League ball. And it didn't diminish his stuff. In fact, uh, Imanaga's stuff plus rating during the World Baseball Classic was better than Yamamoto's and every other pitcher who pitched in the World Baseball Classic. He led the entire tournament. Frank, stuff plus. that's a detail that I feel like you should not have left out. I don't know why you didn't say that. <laughs> you did say it, didn't you? Yeah, because the thing God. is, I had to let you say it because I didn't know if I said it or not. So. Gosh, I know. I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Everyone. I just, you, you built it up in a, in a, in a really special way that I really appreciate. Uh, yeah. I probably should have hyped it up better than, uh, I, you know, people wonder now. why we repeat each other sometimes. And I, it's because I'm, you know, I'm, I know what Frank's going to ask me next. And I was trying to prepare my thoughts for that. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Let's talk about that. Exactly. Scott, the breakouts let's, we got to pick it up. Come on guys. Let's go. I, it's, it's my fault. All right. Well, I'll, I'll start. It. Yuri oh, Perez, Cole Reagan, Cole Reagan's and Tarek Skubal. I'll take the I'll take the Olive Garden breadsticks. Uh, listen to the first episode. I think we talked about all. No, we talked about two of them <laughs> on the first episode, one on the second. Listen to all of our episodes, and you'll find out why we love those three guys. Because we all love those three guys a whole bunch. Sure do. 
Scott, you're up. Yeah. Carl Reagans, Tarek Skubal, Yuri Perez, yada, yada. All right, here's one we haven't talked about. Mitch Keller. I'm into Mitch Keller. I think this is the year. I mean, he's been making progress the last couple of years. I think this is the year he finally brings it all home. Uh, he had 210 strikeouts last year. So even if we just take last year's numbers at face value, I think those strikeouts are worth the cost. But he did also have a 421 ERA, which is unappetizing. I get that. But if he had... So, <laughs> so Mitch Keller in the second half had four of those disaster starts that afflicted so much of the pitching population last year in, in a year with a ton of rule changes. He had four starts in the second half where he allowed seven earned runs or more. It was actually his four star, only four starts all season where he allowed seven earned runs or more. If you take just those four starts out, his ERA drops from 421 to 313. He has a 114 whip to go with it. He has 10.1K 10 10 per nine to go with it. And this is a guy pitching, taking on an ace workload. I mean, if, if you look at his game log, and remember there, there are those four really ugly starts in there, but the good starts... I mean, seven innings, four hits, seven strikeouts, six innings, 10 strikeouts, nine innings, eight strikeouts, seven innings, 13 strikeouts, uh, seven innings, two hits, seven strikeouts. Like, I, I didn't even list them all. There are a lot of starts in Mitch Keller's game log like that. He delivers the kinds of starts only accessible to aces. And I think he just had a handful of starts last year where it all snowballed on him and skewed his ERA. I'm hoping after a year of enduring that, He's able to come up with better coping coping mechanisms for it, able to keep it together when things begin to spiral out of control, and is able to deliver closer to that low to threes mid ERA to go along with the big innings and big strikeout numbers. My my one concern with Mitch Keller, he's bad against lefties, and teams really stacked their lineups against him last year. He had 430 plate appearances against left-handed batters, 395 against righties, you might be aware there are fewer left-handed batters in ba Major League Baseball than there are right-handed batters. That is a, a legitimate weakness that teams exploited. His curveball and cutter were really good against righties. They were terrible against lefties. So that's the one where can he develop a... a, a I mean, he's got like six pitches. So can he <laughs> turn the changeup into a pitch that he can use to neutralize lefties? I think that's the path forward for him. Breakouts for me, we've talked a lot about Michael King, but I do have him here on the list. We talked about the final eight starts. He was awesome. 188 ERA, 110 whip, positive park shift going from the uh, New York over to Petco. Lots of injury risk, but I do think the upside is sky high for Michael King. Brian Woo, that's Brian Woo from the Seattle Mariners. The pitcher I loved on Valentine's Day, SP61, the ADP is 215.2. And uh, the whiffs are there, 12.5% swinging strike rate, tied for second among rookie pitchers last year. Did a great job limiting hard contact, a 345 expected ERA. Brian Wu relies heavily on a really good fastball, 207 batting average against, with a 14.6% swinging strike rate. That was higher than the swinging strike rate on Spencer Strider's fastball last year. And I just trust the Mariners' pitching development. They've done a great job with George Kirby and Logan Gilbert. Uh, Brian Wu, been winding up with him typically as like my SP4, SP5. If you listen to my strategy the other day, like to get three of my top 30, then I wait and I lo load up on a bunch of these sleepers and breakouts, which I am revealing right now. Uh, the last breakout that I have is Brandon Fott, the SP64. Shout out to the Welsh, by the way. Uh, 241 ADP, hyped up prospect from last year, got off to an awful start. His first six starts, a 982 ERA. Fott got sent down where he uh, – they moved where he was pitching on the rubber, uh, moved him to the first base side, and it helped. Upon returning in July, uh, he also made some changes to its pitch mix. He added a sinker. He threw more sweepers. It's a really, really good sweeper. Final 16 starts, including the postseason, a 396 ERA, a 124 whip, over a strikeout per inning. Those numbers don't blow you away, but I think he kind of found something that works, and I think that they are going to continue to build on that. And I think we get an even better version of Brandon Fott this year. Let's move into the bust. A lot of names that we've already kind of mentioned, but Scott, who do you have at uh, at bust here? Yeah, at busts, I have Joe Ryan, who we did talk about in part two. And so I'll just reiterate very quickly. 
that uh, he was a disaster in <laughs> toward the end of last season, really the entire second half, really more than the second half, his final, uh, I'm not doing this real quickly, his final 14 starts, he had a 662 ERA, and he allowed 3.2 home runs per nine innings. He was dealing with a groin issue that he eventually took some time off to, to, re, to clear up. Still had a 479 ERA after returning in seven starts. I think because he relies on the gimmick of a low velocity but deceptive fastball with that rising effect that the league seems to be catching up to and Jerrine doesn't really have anything else to fall back on, I think it could just be an unmitigated disaster for him this year. And um, it may be the last we hear of him as a major league starter. So I'm I'm looking to avoid him, certainly at his ADP. Uh, and then Bryce Miller, who we talked about earlier today. So I'll just let that. I'll let what I say said about Bryce Miller earlier stand. Chris, bust, starting pitcher. My, I'm not really like feeling it. And I'm not really not, I'm not going to put my chest into it. We've talked a lot about Tyler Glass now, Blake Snell and, and George Kirby. I don't love their prices. I think it's unlikely the bottom falls out for them, but Glass now we're overlooking a lot of injury risk to draft him as a top 12 starting pitcher. Blake Snell, it's just not generally been a good time to draft him coming off good seasons. And George Kirby, I just think is probably more like the 15th best starting pitcher than the ninth best or wherever he goes. So, I, I can see the case for all of them. I just don't like the prices, but I'm struggling with my true busts at starting pitcher. All right. Well, bus 2.0 coming soon. Chris, you better. Get yeah, I got I to put some work in. Uh, bus for me. I'm going to start with Aaron Nola. He's the 11th starting pitcher off the board. It, it's just too high. A 446 ERA or higher in two of the past three seasons. The strikeout rate and the swinging strike rate both took a step back last year as well. I think this is more justified in a head-to-head -head points league because Nola is a true workhorse, but in any type of roto or categories, I have him more like SP20 in the rankings. Joe Ryan, I completely agree with you, Scott, Every all the points you made on, on why he's a bust. Uh, the pitcher I don't agree with you on is Mitch Keller, who I do have as a bust this year, uh, even though he's going a little bit later around pick 145. Everything you said, right? You take away the, the, the really bad starts in the second half. Well, if you leave them in, he had a 524 ERA over the final three months of the season. He is prone to these big blow-up starts. And while the strikeouts went up for Mitch Keller, I don't really have an explanation. The swinging strike rate was 9.7%. It just it doesn't really line up. So he did some nice things last year. He had a career year, uh, but I, I don't like the ratios. I can't explain the strikeouts. And, you know, the team context with the Pirates is obviously... Let me let me just go a little further with the, the the ace caliber starts that Mitch Keller had, because it's easy to say, okay, his second half ERA, he had those disaster starts and his overall ERA was terrible. It just in the second half, Mitch Keller had a six inning start with 12 strikeouts. He had an eight shutout inning start. He had another eight shutout inning start where he allowed just two hits. Um, and then he had three quality starts apart from that. So it was like, it was even just in the second half. It was a tale of two pitchers and Chris looks like he wants to say something. He's raising his hand very politely. <laughs> you can't just take out the bad starts and not take out the good starts. I'm totally fine. If you want to take out the four bad starts, I think you got to take out the four best starts too. That's the only way. No, that I, I don't. I disagree. I disagree. I, I think very few pitchers in baseball are capable of the starts that I just rattled off for Mitch Keller with the consistency that he delivered him. He, he, he shows an, a level of upside that, that few pitchers can even hope dream of. Over Mitch Keller's final 13 starts, he allowed six earned runs or more five times. If yeah. you had him in the lineup for all of those starts, it doesn't matter about the good starts that he gave you in the second But, but it's a 559 ERA over his final 13 starts. It was a weird year for pitching specifically in that way. And unlike most of the pitchers who succumbed to that stuff, Mitch Keller had amazing starts. So like maybe pitching's just bad forever. And Mitch Keller, among other pitchers, is never going to be able to overcome the, the, the that snowball effect. But if he is among the pitchers that do, he's probably an ace because of, of how good his good starts are. Agree to disagree, Scott. Disagreement is good. 
people like to hear both sides of the coin and you just got it on Mitch Keller. Let's wrap up with, uh, I don't know, like a hundred pitchers in 20 minutes. Why not? Starting pitcher ADP continued. We left off with, uh, I think it was Lucas Chilito, right? That was the last name we talked about. Whatever. Um, just in case we don't get into like the super deep names, we will have a podcast coming up soon with deep sleepers. So don't you worry about that. Uh, back into groups of three, Ryan Pepio, Charlie Morton, and Shota Imanaga, SP58 through 60, picks 197 through 204. Chris, you are up. Pepio, Morton, and Imanaga. I like all three of these guys. I like them at their cost. I like them probably ahead of their cost, if that's what it takes. Uh, Pepio, probably my least favorite of the three, but look, he's a guy that the Rays went out and got. He, he's my favorite he's of the three. Yeah. always had really good stuff. He's always had really good results in the minors. He's always struggled with walks. All of a sudden, last year towards the end, no struggles with walks. He had elite command down the stretch. So Pepio is... I think there's a, a lot to like. I wonder how whether he can sustain the increased control, obviously, but also just can he sustain the increased control while getting the whiffs and the strikeouts that he got in the minors? I think those are fair questions, but at this price, I, I don't think there's much downside. And, you know, Morton, the whip is going to be probably pretty ugly at this point in his career, but pretty good bet for 180 or so strikeouts probably a good era probably a bunch of wins and we talked about shoto imanaga there's there's a lot to like about the profile it, it there's uncertainty but this feels like kodai senga where the the upside is not being baked into his draft costs nearly enough and remember senga was being drafted in this similar range last year now he's a top 25 starting pitcher in, in adp Mm -hmm. Two final points on Imanaga. His uh, K per nine and walks per nine, both better than Yamamoto in Japan last year. No, I don't think Imanaga is going to be better, but I thought it was interesting. He's also an extreme fly ball pitcher and he's pitching in Wrigley Field. So there will be starts where the wind is blowing out and I'm sure bad things are going to happen for Imanaga. So just keep that in mind. Next up, we have Brian Wu, Tristan McKenzie, and Aaron Savali. SP 61 through 63, picks 207 through 223. Scott, you get this group. Wu, McKenzie, Savali. I mean, you already talked about liking Wu and Savali. I don't share quite your enthusiasm, but I, I think they're fine where they're being drafted here. McKenzie, obviously, you're, you're gambling on him bouncing back. It's a shoulder injury he's coming back from, right? And uh, he had a long injury history before that. It was yeah. a strained right terrace major in his shoulder to right. start the year and then it was a sprained right elbow so double way right so it's everything i can't i can't say i'm optimistic in mckenzie bouncing back and giving us another year like he had in 2022 or he's a borderline ace albeit with a you know not so great strikeout rate not amazing strikeout rate uh and so i i i can't say i'm particularly motivated to draft him but I get it. I get why people want to take him here. There's, you know, if he's, if he's back to being 2022 McKenzie, it's a great deal. I just don't think he will be. Yeah. One year removed from a 296 ERA, 0.95 whip, and 190 strikeouts for Tristan McKenzie. Major, major questions in terms of the health. Brandon Fott, Nestor Cortez, and Andrew Abbott, SP 64 through 66, picks 225 to 229. Chris, you're up. Uh, Andrew Abbott and Brandon Fott are, are, kind of it's not the spider-man meme because they don't throw out the same arm so it's just a mirror uh really really good breaking balls a lot of trouble keeping the ball in the park for both of them i i have abbott as a, a sleeper in my sleepers 1.0 i think it's a a really nice bet on a really talented pitcher obviously the home park and his fly ball tendencies make it a very very tough combination but he might just miss enough bats that he you know pitches to a high threes era with a ton of strikeouts i think that's a a viable outcome for andrew abbott obviously i really like nestor cortez uh brandon fought i i don't know the sweeper's really good that might be all he has and sweepers get crushed by opposite handed hitters so that's i think going to be a real concern for him he gave about 22 home runs last season in much less than a full-time role so 
I, I have some real concerns at this price. It's hard to actually say I wouldn't draft any pitcher going in this range, but uh, I'm not I'm not super excited about Brandon Font necessarily. 22 home runs allowed in 96 innings, just over two home runs per nine. Yeah, that, that's not great. That's bad. No, it's it's bad. And again, part of me calling him a breakout is projecting forward and assuming growth here with Brandon Fott. For what it's worth, pitched really well in the postseason. 327 ERA, 109 whip, 10.6K per nine, 24% K minus walk rate. Next up, we have Nick Lodolo, Marcus Stroman, and Max Scherzer, SP 67 through 69, picks 231 to 237. Scott, back to you. Lodolo, Stroman, Scherzer. Well, I, I mean, Scherzer, we know he's going to miss half the season, but he'll probably be Max Scherzer after that. I mean, he's getting pretty old, so I guess you can't guarantee it. But I, I think he's among the more attractive injury stashes since we do have a pretty clear timetable for him and we know what his upside can be. So I think this is a reasonable point to take him. Strowman is about as middling, as globby as you can get. He'll, he'll have his uses next year, but he's not going to win anybody any championships. Lodolo, I think, is being overlooked. He, he feels like a post-type sleeper. I'm actually writing about post-type sleepers right now. Um, you know, he was he was one of the buzziest breakout picks last year, 11.4K per nine as a rookie. And even during the short time he pitched in 2023 before injuries, uh, per, per, specifically a stress fracture in his leg, he got tons of strikeouts. Um, so it, it sounds like he, he may be delayed for the start of the season. I think David Bell said things would have to go perfectly for for him to be on the the open in the opening day rotation. But he's he's obviously going late here. He's got that strikeout upside. And I want to say real quick because I see I see you commenters commenting <laughs> about how bad my ERA is going to be because of because I'm prioritizing these high strikeout guys within the glob. You don't understand glob theory. Glob theory says that ERA is random in this environment. Don't look at last year's ERA for any of these guys because you're liable to be wrong and you may be wrong in a way that is detrimental to your team's cause. It's just too much randomness being introduced with all the changes to the pitching environment. And the one reliable stat is strikeouts. And you know what? If you're missing bats, you're making yourself less subject to that randomness, less subject to balls sneaking through with the shift being gone. Except that is glob Keller. theory. Maybe you reject glob theory and you're allowed, but that is glob theory. And if you deny, if, if, you, if you're just saying, oh, my ERAs are going to be bad, then you, it, it's just a sign you don't understand glob theory. Well, let's continue on into that glob. Brian Bayo, Kyle Harrison, and Yusei Kikuchi, SP70 through 72, picks 238 through 247. Uh, Chris, a pretty interesting group here. You talked about Kikuchi, but also two kind of young upside arms still in, in Bayo and Harrison. Yeah, Harrison's Harrison's a weird one, man, because he, he was a, a pretty big pitching prospect. I'm not necessarily sure how good this stuff is outside of the fastball. Um, so I'll start with, I really like Yusei Kikuchi at his price. I, I think he is comparable to Nick Pavetta. Rewind about 37 minutes uh, to hear me make that case. Um, Brian Bayo, I don't know. I, I, I want to like him, but I feel like he might just be Marcus Stroman. And that's not a bad thing, right? Like it, that's that's a useful pitcher, like we talked about. I just don't know if the strikeouts are going to come for Brian Bayo. And without he did, that, he did work this off season with Pedro Martinez on a slider, mm -hmm. which is his there best. You go. Which was his best swing and miss pitch already, if I'm remembering. No, that. the changeup. The changeup. Yeah, okay. changeup's been his best pitch. Well, if he it. can turn that slider into a swing and miss pitch. Then maybe. Yeah, but look, I, I'm, I, I'm with you overall. I mean, I, I think, I think at, at this price, I, I'd rather, you know, roll the dice on him than than one of the veterans who who's going behind him. So that that's fine. But my expectations are probably high threes, low fours ERA, not a super helpful whip, not a ton of strikeouts. Look, if we're talking about post hype sleepers, I, I think Brian Bayou fits perfectly into that mix. This is someone who had huge prospect pedigree. 
Uh, and he did some good things last year. Still got a bunch of ground balls. He improved the control. You know, if that slider turns into anything, I, I think we could see a, a, a breakout-esque type season here from Brian Bayo. Next up, we have Paul Skeens, Reed Detmers, and Jacob deGrom. SP 73 through 75, picks 249 to 253. Scott, this group is all over the place. You get the number one pick. You get the best pitcher of this generation who's going to miss, I don't know, probably the first four or five months of the season. What do you got? <laughs> Yeah, at least I'm not nearly as keen on stashing to Grom as I am, am on Scherzer. And even in Scherzer's case, it's like a with your last pick kind of. Are move. you are you keen on Skeens though? Am I keen on Skeens? Uh yeah. I mean yeah, as as with any pitching prospect, it's you you can't take it to the bank exactly what he's going to be. But he throws very hard. He has a great slider. He was the first overall pick and he was advanced enough from his time in college that we're likely to see him at some point this year. I don't think it's going to be early enough to justify taking him in this range, but if you're chasing upside, I, I, I can understand why people do it. I'm just saying it wouldn't be me. And who is the third guy we're talking about here? Reed Detmers. Reed Detmers, another post type sleeper. Cause remember there were a few pitchers hyped as much as Detmers at this time a year ago. He was coming off that tremendous finish in 2022, added a couple miles per hour to his slider, getting, all kinds of strikeouts. Uh, and then he added even more velocity to the slider last spring. The hype ramped up all the more. And it it, it, it kind of changed the characteristics of the pitch too much. And, and it lost all its effectiveness. Uh, it was not good. He also tweaked the slider midseason last year and, and finished better, did Detmers. But he says, uh, he, I was just reading an article about him. He said uh, he wasn't, finding a consistent velocity with it. Sometimes it was real hard. Sometimes it was slower. He thinks he's evened it out now and it's at an, a lower velocity than last year. He, th he thinks he's back. It's back basically to where it was in 2022 when there was and, so much more excitement. And now he's not in a six man rotation anymore, which is maybe the most valuable thing for Reed Detmers. And that was the, the slider. I mean, presumably one of the weirder splits that I've seen is Detmers was better in 2023 against righties than he was in 2022. As expected. That's what we thought would happen. He was dreadful against lefties. He had an 882 OPS allowed to left-handed batters. The year I've before, left. it was like 600. He was so much worse against lefties in a way that I have to think will even out and lead to improvement, even if nothing else happens. So I'm not in on Reed Detmers as a top 30 starting pitcher like I was last year. That was where I had Reed Detmers ranked. Yes, but I will draft him at this cost very often. Yeah, the 74th starting pitcher off the board. Uh, I read a little bit too from Angel's new pitching coach, Barry Enright. He apparently identified some mechanical tweaks in Detmers' delivery and said Detmers will be a star. So we shall see. Kenta Maeda. Detmers himself said he'd win 20 games last year, and we all know how that turned out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think I think I'm 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 warming up to Detmers as a sleeper again, I guess is how I'd put it. Kenta Maeda, who signed a two-year $24 million deal with the Tigers, Mason Miller, who is gonna pitch pitch out of the bullpen for the A's, and Lance Lynn, who signed a one-year deal with the Cardinals. Starting pitcher 76 through 70 picks 257 to 264. Chris Maeda, Mason Miller, Lance Lynn. All about drafting Mason Miller as a relief pitcher sleeper. This feels like a guy who's going to get transitioned to the bullpen and just turn into an absolute star. He has thrown 72.2 innings in the professional ranks across all levels since being drafted in 2021, which is not very good or not very many. He has 107 strikeouts across all levels in those 72.2 innings. Yes, it's a bad team, but I, I think Mason Miller could be a, I don't want to say Josh Hader because that's setting the bar too high, but I like, I think he could be a true impact one inning reliever as a, as a closer. So I'm, very excited about Mason Miller, and I didn't talk about Lance Lynn for a reason. 
All righty, then let's keep it moving. John Means, Clayton Kershaw, and Luis Severino. SP 79 through 81, picks 267 to 282. Scott, you get a group that's filled with injured pitchers. <laughs> Means, Kershaw, Severino. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could make the argument for Luis Severino that I made for Chris Sale if you have the faith in the Mets front office that I have in the Braves front office, though I don't know why you would have that kind of confidence in the Mets front office. But they, you know, they gambled on the upside of Luis Severino after a disastrous year for him that was, uh, you know, there were injuries, as there usually are for him. But in between the injuries, he was not good at all. And um, 665 ERA. I, I don't know. I mean, we're late enough that you could just roll the dice on him. And, and if it doesn't work out, move on without too much pain. But uh, it's not something I'm particularly motivated to do. And having I said am. that, you are, Chris? Yes. Okay. What, do you, what, do you, what are you optimistic about? It's mostly just that the stuff mostly looked pretty much all right. And there's been talk that he was tipping pitches. And I, I mostly think it's just like bet on a talented pitcher, bet on a guy who's been a top 10 guy before. Hope that a change of scenery helps him figure it out. And, you know, the fact that the, the, the velocity, the pitch movement, all that stuff was mostly the same last year makes me feel good about it as a sleeper, as a sleeper, to be clear. Yeah. I mean, the cost is low enough, like I said, that it's, you know, if you're just guessing at that and you guess wrong, who cares? Not a lot. Not a lot of bad's gonna happen to you. Um, yeah, John Means. I've been excited about him in the past. I'm still looking forward to the day when he eventually gets to try out that new deep left field fence, which I feel like the Orioles changed just for him because it's so perfectly tailored to his skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did appear late last year. Didn't strike out much of anybody. And now it sounds like he's behind schedule and won't be ready for opening day. So. Between the, the low strikeout rate last year and the delayed start, it's hard to get excited about John Means at this particular moment. Clayton Kershaw, by the way, did re-sign with the Dodgers and also had surgery on his shoulder back in November. Told reporters that he's targeting a July or August-ish return later in the season. Christopher Sanchez, Michael Waka, and Ranger Suarez, SP82. Christopher Sanchez is this late? I can't believe it. Yeah, I it might be dragged down by just like one ADP source. Actually, no. There's two uh, where he's going outside the top 375. Yeah, ESPN and Yahoo. So he's more like 250 for NFBC, CBS, and RTS. Um, but still, I mean, he's the 283rd pitcher drafted by player. Drafted. The five. It's, it's too low any way you look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get Christopher Sanchez on your team. Uh who are we up to? Chris, you're up. Any thoughts on Michael Waka, Ranger Suarez? I I don't think there's much point in having thoughts about Michael Waka or Ranger Suarez. Michael Waka's had a helpful ERA and whip the past couple of seasons. The peripherals don't really back it up. He's going where he is for a reason, and I'm not offended that he is uh, going where he is. Same with Ranger Suarez. I think in... Deeper leagues, you could talk yourself into it with Waka. Past two years, a 327. He's used, right? Yeah, he'll be useful. 14 whip. Um, you know, he's going to get hurt, but also pitching in I, a really good park now, Kansas City. I mean, he may put up numbers very similar to Jose Barrios for a much lower cost. So, much definitely less globby. Much less innings globby. upside, though. Innings upside, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah that's fair. Next up, we have Alec Manoa, Griffin Canning, and Emmett Sheehan. Actually, a really interesting group. SP 85 right. through 87, picks 291 to 295. Uh, Scott, everything went wrong for Manoa last year, but even yeah. these other two men, like Griffin Canning gets a lot of whiffs. Like, mm -hmm. I, I do have some interest there. And then, like, Sheehan, I wrote up as a breakout as well. It's just how many starts will he actually make for the Dodgers? Yeah, I think Canning has good mid level upside. I think Sheehan has huge upside. Uh, <laughs> particularly in terms of strikeouts and, but yeah, I mean, it, it, are the Dodgers going to treat him like a conventional starter? Is he going to be in and out of the rotation constantly? Is it really worth pursuing that upside? Those are my questions with him and why I didn't feature him when we were talking about sleepers. I have him a sleeper as a sleeper in the broad sense, but there are practicality concerns for Emmett Sheehan. There were for Spencer Strider two years ago, and look how that turned out. So it's definitely worth noting the upside for Sheehan. 
Uh, I also want to mention for Alec Manoa, I'm a little more keen on taking a late round gamble on him than on like a Luis Severino because clearly something was broken for Alec Manoa. We're going to know pretty soon if it's fixed or not. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. by the time we're drafting in earnest in late March, we'll, we'll have a pretty good idea whether it's fixed or not. He, he basically says he didn't prepare well last year. And when he started at, when he, when he ran into issues early in the year, he, um, he got in his head. He, he kept trying to make changes that maybe he didn't make. He, he just lost confidence in himself, basically. And it, it all kind of, the snowball effect was something that swallowed Manoa up over a, a, a full season's time. He had a great off season. He lost a bunch of weight. You know, two years ago, he was the top three Cy Young finisher. And I think he could maybe recapture that upside very quickly. And you've spent next to nothing on him. So definitely one you want to monitor this spring, if nothing else, Alec Manoa. Chris, you're up. Taj Bradley, Mackenzie Gore, John Gray. Uh, you and I were hanging out with Nick Pollock the other day, and he is convinced that Taj Bradley's not good, which makes me very sad because Nick Pollock's super smart. And I have Taj Bradley as a sleeper. And, and part of that is just, I think the stuff is really good. I, I, I have concerns about the command, and that was the big thing that Nick brought up. But I also just think the way the Rays used him last year was really weird. He had all this success over those first three starts. Then they send him back down. They say he needed to work on his command. That's a tough thing for a young player to go through, though. Like, I'm at the major league level. I, I accomplished my dream. I'm succeeding. I think it was like 23 strikeouts to two walks over his first three starts. And then he gets sent back down. Like they are humans. This is a this is a, a game played by humans, and that's a really tough thing. Uh, so I, I like Taj Bradley betting on the the post type sleeper appeal. I you've got in the notes a lot of smart people like Cutter Crawford. That that's exactly how I feel. I don't really see it, but I'm you're jumping ahead, Chris. Oh, sorry. Did I did I jump ahead? Oh, yep, <laughs> yep, yeah. yep, yep. yep. All right, Taj Bradley, Mackenzie Gore, John Gray. Um, I don't think Mackenzie Gore has the the repertoire to get through lineups. He's a lefty who doesn't throw a pitch that can get righties out. So I just think that's going to be too big of an issue for him. But if he if he overcomes that, the fastball is really good. The breaking pitches are pretty solid. I just think that's a, a fatal flaw for him. So I'm not too interested in making that bet. You mentioned we were hanging out with Nick Pollock. He did not like Taj Bradley. He did like Cutter Crawford quite a bit. Scott, you get Cutter Crawford, Seth Lugo, and Edward Cabrera. I mean, 12.5% swinging strike rate is where I begin for Cutter Crawford. That's really good. That is a sort of swinging strike rate normally found among pitchers ranked much higher than this. Um, he has... I. I it, he has good upside, and, and the Red Sox made sure to keep a rotation spot open for him, like I was saying about Nick Pavetta. Uh, I don't think he has, like, ace upside, but I think I think he could be... Um, I don't know. What's a good comparison? I think he could be... I don't know. I I guess it's I guess it's kind of similar to Bailey Ober. Yeah, that's exactly the exactly the, the name I was about to say as you were searching for it. Yeah. So I, you know, obviously much cheaper. I, I think his job security is less than Bailey Ober. But like I said, the Red Sox made sure to leave a spot open for him. Also, so that, that gives me hope for Cutter Crawford. Seth Lugo is undervalued at this price. I, I, I think Seth Lugo is very likely to outperform that cost, probably by a decent margin, too. Yeah, he signed a three-year, $45 million deal with the Royals. And he was rock solid last year with the Padres at the time. 357 ERA, 120 whip, 8.6K per nine, decent amount of ground balls. I think he's fine. Again, like kind of like Waka, uh, just a, a deep league, kind of throw him in mm -hmm. there, solid starter. I, yeah, I think L Lugo is fine. Uh, next group, Dean Kramer, Reese Olsen, and Sean Manaya. Chris, you're up. I think Reese Olsen is kind of interesting. He looked pretty good, especially early on. Then, you know, the league kind of, caught up to him and I'm not sure if it's uh if the stuff is good enough to really be a standout but 
you know, it's a, it's a good park. It's, you know, given the, the amount of youth there, it's an improving team. So hopefully the circumstances are at least average around him. I, I think Reese Olsen's totally fine here. And Taylor Wells, I mean, he looked really good in the first half last year. He was arguably, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, arguably the Orioles' best starting pitcher in the he's first kinda, half. He's kind of Bailey Oberish too. Yeah, and then got moved to the bullpen or got sent down. There were there were inning concerns for him, and that's tough to overcome as well. But really, really good home park. And I'm skipping ahead again, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, you totally are. But it's fine. I mean, we're <laughs> just about, about to wrap up here. Uh, Scott, of all the names that you see left on the rundown or anyone that comes to your mind that we uh, haven't talked about yet again, uh-huh. we're going to have future podcasts to continue talking about pitching. Um, was there anyone else that you wanted to mention quickly? James Paxton, the Dodgers obviously believe in him. He'll have the Dodgers offense backing him. I'm not sure he'll hold up for even half the season, but for the half the season that he holds up, James Paxton's numbers should be pretty good. Uh, let me see if I can find anyone else here real quick. I mean, most of the other ones look really globby <laughs> and just like players. We're going to stream off the waiver wire, Kyle Gibson, miles, Michaelis, Bryce Chris elder. Paddock. You mentioned Chris Paddock already in your sleepers though, right? Yep. Yeah. I was so. listening <laughs> you to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, to um, Frank saying that we didn't mention them already. Oh, Logan Allen. Yep. Logan Allen had stretches last year where he looked he looked like he might be on the level of Tanner Bybee and mm-hmm. he's just kind of an afterthought in drafts even though he has a spot locked up in the Guardians rotation um I don't think the stuff is as good as Bybee but it plays well it gets strikeouts beyond what you'd expect and um yeah I think I think Logan Allen could be could surprise for where he's going all right, just some quickly, some prospects uh, that you you may need to know. Obviously, Max Meyer returning from injury for the Marlins. Then there's Jackson Job with the Tigers, Cade Horton with the Cubs, Hurston Waldrop with the Braves. We could throw A.J. smith Chauver in that mix as well. Uh, Drew Thorpe and Robbie Snelling with the Padres, Robert Gasser with the Brewers, Jared Jones with the Pirates, Christian Scott with the Mets. All names, I think, could make an impact this season. And uh, injury stashes, if you're looking for Robbie Ray with the Giants, Jeffrey Springs and Drew Rasmussen with the Rays. Uh, Brandon Woodruff, maybe. I don't know if he's going to pitch this year. Yeah. There is a chance. Uh, he just re-signed with the Brewers. And Dustin May and Tony Gonsolin with the Dodgers. Not especially high. Not especially hopeful on any of those guys coming back and making a substantive impact. Maybe Robbie Ray has the best chance. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would be it would still be pretty late in his case. I just want to mention one last name. Chase Silseth. I like the strikeout upside for Chase Silseth with the Angels. He's a deep sleeper. All right. We did it. Three starting pitcher previews in the books and still uh, lots to come here. As, as we ramp up for draft season, we're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to fantasy baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.